In this video, we are going to look at a, a few things. We're going to get started. Um, we're not going to be able to finish. We're going to start looking at interrupts. Um, and to dem demonstrate the interrupts, we're going to look at an internal Cortex M0 peripheral called the SysTech, uh, which is a very simple timer. Um, and so this will give you like a basis to start your own like timing experiments, so you can uh, you know have ac an accurate time base to re to really control things. So. Um, what I'm going to do is uh, first bring up, let me bring up the reference manual. And um, so if we come in chapter three, chapter three tells us a lot about how this particular chip is, is configured, you know, with respect to the, you know, ARM Cortex uh, core. And one thing it tells us is it has the cystic timer implemented. Um, uh, and the other thing it mentions is this nested vector interrupt controller. So if you go to ARM's website, um, it's a good idea to read about, you know, the history of the, the NVIC. It, it was really um, engineered to solve, you know, some of the interrupt problems in the ARM7, you know, TDMI, ARM7 chips. Um, but it, it, it has some really powerful features like tail chaining. You know, it's really easy to write interrupt vectors. They're no different than any other function. Um, and so if you remember what, you know, what an interrupt is, an interrupt is an exception. It's something that happens in hardware, you know, um, that will raise a flag to the processor. When the processor sees an interrupt, um, it will then look at the interrupt vector table, um, you know, for that particular interrupt source. So if there's, say, 256 possible interrupts, um, there's going to be a table with 256 addresses. Um, and it looks for that address and jumps to that location. And there's going to be what's called an interrupt vector um, or an interrupt handler sitting there. So, um, so what's kind of cool is you can preempt the the, the microprocessor um, with other stuff, timers, UARTs, and it'll stop what it's doing and jump to you know some other code. And um, you know, it kind of gives a, a little bit of, you know a model of preemption. So with within the uh, so like I said, there's this concept of the NVIC. And the way the NVIC works, it's a peripheral within the ARM, text, ARM Cortex core. It's actually not going to be documented in this reference manual. It's going to be documented in ARM documentation. And it tells you right here, technical reference manual. Um, and the basic way it works is all these modules are is different stuff in the Kinetis chip. Uh, serial ports, you know, whatever that might want to generate interrupts to flag the microprocessor that has to do something. Uh, they go into this, uh, the NVIC here, and will flag, you know, the core to, to do something. All right. Now, uh, like I said, there is the concept of an interrupt table. Um, and what the interrupt table is, is simply a table of addresses. It has an address of the function that's supposed to execute whenever the interrupt, you know, occurs. So, um, so there's kind of two different concepts, uh, which is what's called vector number and then IRQ number. Vector number is just an index starting from zero, where it turns out that the, the first uh, index of the table isn't actually an address. It's the initial stack pointer. Um, address four is the actual initial program counter, where, where that's what the chip does right after reset. Um, so the first 16 vectors are actually part of the ARM core. That's something that ARM kind of designed in there. And then all the vectors after the first 16 are to be implemented by, you know, whoever made the chip, whether it be Freescale or, you know, Atmel or Texas Instruments. Um, that's the system integrator. So we can look down here and see, okay, UART is, you know, vector number 28. Um, now in, you know, the ARM world, there's this thing called IRQ number. IRQ number is essentially the vector number minus 16. It's the it's the starting number of you know the external interrupt, something that's outside of the ARM core. Um, and in the case of uh, the Cortex M0, there are 32 IR, extra IRQs. Um, the M3 and the M4, I think, I have up to 256. And you can read through, there's different priority levels. Uh, we won't get into that right now. So what we're going to look at is how do we use, um, it's kind of two levels. How do we use an interrupt, you know, from a peripheral, from in the ARM peripheral, uh, 
uh, the cystic timer. Then in another video, we'll look at what's called a non-core vector, because there's one extra step for these guys in the in the NVIC. Um, and the reason we're starting there, it turns out that all of these uh, sources here, like the cystic, he does not route through the NVIC. He goes directly to the ARM core. So we don't have to, have to program the NVIC uh, to make the SysTick work. Um, so what we can do is bring up the, sys, the, uh, the documentation um, for the SysTick. And I found the uh, Cortex-M0 generic user's guide. It's on ARM's website. Um, and the, you can find everything, instruction set, everything you want to know about this microprocessor. Uh, so chapter 4.4 .4 is, it says optional system timer. Well, the Freescale documentation said we definitely made it. Um, and it's kind of nice. So no matter which ARM core you go to, there's always a SysTick. Uh, whether TI makes it or whatever vendor, there's going to be a SysTick. And they're going to be at the same, you know, at, at, at nice addresses. So the SysTick is actually pretty simple. Um, all it is, is is a counter. It starts at some value. Um you know, and counts down. And when it gets to zero, it will just reload this uh, some, some value in the RVR register. So it'll go from RVR to zero, RVR to zero. Um, now, one thing you can do is when the counter transitions to zero, it can set a flag, and that flag can generate an interrupt. So it's pretty easy to see that you can create a periodic interrupt if you just set that RVR and just have it count down. So if it counts down from a thousand to zero and interrupt, that's a thousand uh, clock cycles. And if you know the processor speed, you can say, well, that's this many microseconds we're going to get an interrupt. And it'll keep happening periodically. And every time there's an interrupt, um, the ARM core is going to want to jump to the interrupt vector for the SysTick. Um, so we'll look here. Basically, uh, it's pretty simple. Um, there's an interrupt request. We enable it. Um, we set a you know processor clock. We tell it that's what we want, it, and, and that's it. And it kind of tells you if you, you read down here. Basically, you want to program the reload value, clear the current value, and then program the status and control register, and it just works. Um, so that's easy enough. So I have a project in uh, Code Warrior. It should be on the site you found this video, and um, what I do is under sources, I have a file called sysTick.c. And sysTick just has a couple functions for, for making the sysTick work. Uh, the first one's called init sysTick. And what it's going to do is program the reload value to take the core clock, um, and that's what the actual microprocessor uh, clocked at. Now, notice how I have a nice symbol. Well, in the mcg.h file that we learned in the in the clock distribution, you know, I actually put a symbol in here. I almost always run the chip at 48 megahertz. So now I put in core clock of 48, um, 48 million. I have this thing called SysTick frequency. If you think about it, you know, that makes sense. If you simply divide the number of site, you know, the frequency of your uh, at which the counter is being clocked at, divided by how often you want to roll over. Well, that's how many counts you have to count down uh, to get that frequency. So if we look in SysTick.h, I set it to 1,000. 1,000 uh, ticks per second. So this computation yields a value to dump in here. Now, once again, this division here doesn't execute at runtime. It executes at compile time because core clock is constant. SysTick frequency is constant. It's just a number. It's 48 million divided by 1,000. Uh, dumps it in here. So I reset the current value. And lastly, I enable it. I enable the interrupt and tell it which clock source I want. Um, and these, while the documentation certainly is the ARM documentation, um, the Kinetis header file, uh, you know, in the derivative.h, gives me nice symbols for you know, the SysTick, you know, peripheral. Now, the next question is, well, how do I set up the vector table? I know when this thing rolls over, counts down to zero, it's going to want to jump to some function. Well, one of the first videos I pointed out startup code. There is a file called Kinetic Sysident. And in here, let me go down 
it actually defines a table. Now this looks a little goofy, but we'll strip it apart. All this is, is an array, and that's, see what this is, that means array, a variant of vectors, const means it's read only, um, and pointer means we are creating a function, an array of function pointers. So go ahead and go search on Google function pointer tutorial. You'll find some lots of cool stuff. All a function pointer is is an address. It's the address of a function. Um, in this case, it's an address of a function with no arguments. Um, this keyword here just tells the compiler, uh, in this case GCC, to locate this table in a section called vector table. And the linker command file here um, tells the linker where everything goes. So this is where a vector table is put into m interrupts. Then m interrupts is defined to be at address 0 in the flash. And that's just, you know, that's the way it needs to be. Because um, at reset, that's where the uh, cortex expects the vector table. Now, in the init hardware function, this gets called uh, a little bit after boot up. There's actually this VTOR, uh, SCB uh, VTOR register. You can locate the vector table after reset. And what it does is it locates it um, at, you know, the, you know, this right here, this symbol. It turns out it's zero, so it, it didn't really have to do that. But you can have actually multiple vector tables if you want. Um, then from here... The only thing I want you to look at is this is just, you know, an array. And we're initializing the array with these function names, all right? And all these function names, they were prototyped here as, you know, DMA handler. You know, here's one for SysTick handler. Then it also puts um, attribute weak. And what that means is, is that... Uh, um, if no one else defines this function sysTick handler, uh, fill in this function default handler. So if nowhere else in this our program we use sysTick handler, default handler will get populated. So that means if there's a spurious interrupt and we don't fill this in, this function will get called. So what that means uh, for you as a programmer, it's pretty easy. All you need to do is somewhere in your code have a function called sysTick handler. It just has to be the same name. It has to be the same name as this right here, this weak symbol. Um, so what's kind of magical once because the um, once the uh, sysTick is enabled and we right here we have this interrupt enabled, uh, we're going to start jumping to this function. As soon as we jump, it executes this code and leaves no matter what is happening in the foreground. Um, you know, the only case is if there's an interrupt at higher priority, that's executed first. Um, it, you know, and that's it. Now, the any of the non-core interrupts, which we're going to talk about in another video, we actually have to go through one more step, of it, step enable them on the end bic. Um, now, how can we use this? Well, this function gets executed, uh, you know, every millisecond, whether we want it or not. So, as an example, I showed you how to create, um, you know, a nice delay loop. It's better than our goofy delay loop I used in the other, um, the other code because this is almost hardware time, not software. So I made a variable called delay timer tick, and it's an unsigned int, which is 32-bit. Um, notice how I call it static, meaning it's only local to this file, and volatile, all right? I'll talk about volatile in a minute. So every time the SysTick handler uh, gets called, we check to see is it less than our max value, if so, increment. So in the background, this variable is just going to tick up once per millisecond. Now, um, I made a function called delay millisecond. And what this function does is you pass in how many ticks, you know, in milliseconds you want to delay. What I do is I reset the delay timer tick, and then I sit in a while loop. And you notice, within the while loop, I never do anything, because I don't have to. Um, this won't actually sit here forever. I say while delay timer tick is less than the number we passed in to our function. Well, I just happen to know that delay timer tick gets incremented in the background. So we will leave. Now, one thing that's very important here is that this could potentially be confusing to the C compiler. Um, 
had we not used the volatile keyword, the C compiler would have came in here and said, okay, delay timer tick is zero. Okay, then it says, while delay timer tick is less than ticks a millisecond. Well, the compiler's smart. It's going to say, well, wait a minute. In this loop, we never actually modify it, so it's always zero. If it's always zero, it's always less than ticks a millisecond, and it never leaves because it never has to read the variable again because it doesn't know anything about that interrupt. Well, by marking something volatile, that tells the compiler, don't make any assumptions about the, uh, of any variable. It can be changed in, by some background process, by hardware. So every time this while loop comes around, it actually will reread delay timer tick, um, you know, and won't sit here. So the way we use this is pretty simple. Um, over in main.c, I ported some code over from other projects. Um, I, I initialized the PLL, uh, so we have 48 megahertz. I set up uh, the LEDs like we did before. Then I call the initialized sysTick. Once that's called, it's going to start to start to tick away. And look here, I have a delay function. Uh, delay 500 milliseconds and toggle the LED. So let's see what this does. So let me go ahead and download. All right, look at that. Um, we have a red LED, half second. I checked it on the scope. It works great. Um, and it's hardware time. So that, that's pretty cool. Now, I'm going to show you a little trick. While that is certainly useful, um, delay functions, especially in these processors, th this processor um, has a little power to it. Um, we don't want to ever really sit in a while loop. That's kind of a bad use of processor time. Uh, well, this is convenient to use, um, you know, it's not always the best way to approach a problem. So another way you can use a, uh, a ticker, uh, oops, let me get this back, and I'll do this in real time. Um, I'm going to create a couple of uh, variables. I'll call volatile, and there's going to be a, you can structure this about a million different ways. I'm just going to show you one way. Um, I'm going to call unsigned in um, ticker, and I'm going to make it, you know, a four element array. And then down here, I'm going to loop through, um, oops, I is less than four. We go, oops, I'll cap one. Um, I and we'll borrow this code here. Now you could have created four individual variables. I just you know like the array. So what this code is going to do, I create an, an array of four 32-bit numbers and um, called ticker. And every time uh, I interrupt, I have a loop that goes from 0 to 4, and one at a time, ticker of i, you know, I say, is it less than the max value of uh, unsigned int? If so, uh, increment it by 1. So we have four new variables that are always just increasing, you know, in the background. So what I got to do, so the rest of our, um, you know, code can use this. Let me go and go in SysTick, do that, and um, mark it as X turn. That, what that does, it tells the linker when it sees this symbol um, in one object file, you know, it's going to be declared in another, so and link them all up. So. We can talk about that in another slide. So here's the cool part. Instead of delaying, here's a completely different model. We have a ticker. So I'm going to say if ticker of 0, our first one, is greater than or equal to, we'll say 500, 1 half second. What I'm going to do is I'm going to reset him. And I'm going to toggle the red LED. 
Let's make this. Let's make sure I don't have any errors. I didn't have any typos. Okay, you think about what this is going to happen here. Instead of sitting and waiting a delay loop, this for loop is just going around and around and around and around. So it's going to come here, say, is ticker greater than 500, which is 500 milliseconds? If not, leave. Go down here. It's going to keep going around. But once it is, okay, it's time to do something. All right, time to do something. Um, it's going to reset the ticker, then toggle the LED and move on. Then in the background, that ticker is just going to keep counting up. So let's just verify, you know, you know, I'm not crazy here. We're going to load it in, and we should get essentially the same effect. All right, so there we go, half second. Does the exact same thing, except we are not in a blocking, you know, delay loop. Now, here's where it gets interesting. And I might do another video on how, how you can really set this up. Let's say I had other things I wanted to do. You know, I don't want to sit there and wait for my LED. Uh, we can use another ticker. Let's say every second we want to do something else. Now, I'm using Control Enter here to uh, always reset the ticker. And I'll say, uh, do something else. Uh, what do we want to do? Let's toggle the uh, blue LED. So we should go every and the toggle, I'm using that nice port toggle. Um, what's kind of cool about this, if you imagine it goes down through here, if ticker's not greater than 500, we'll move on to this. If this isn't greater than 1,000, move on. So what we have here is like a little mini poor man's scheduler. It's almost of a poor man's cooperative operating system, believe it or not, um, in this primitive form, where we're just using these tickers to schedule stuff. We could have ex functions executing here, whatever we want. But as long as what we do in each one of these if statements doesn't sit there and block, we don't hold off the processor. So if we think about this, the red's going to toggle every half second, the blue every second. So it should alternate between red you know, and uh, red plus blue is like a purple. Um, so let's download this. Let me get my camera in place here. All right, that actually that makes perfect sense. It goes red, purple, and off. Um, and so we could have some other things going on there as well. Um, but we just use a SysTick um, interrupts, and we have like a basic scheduler to kind of do things in our foreground loop. Um, generally, you don't do a whole lot in an interrupt routine. Um, you usually do it in some foreground loop. But uh, uh, we got a nice way to time things in that. So um, that'll be it. Our next video, we'll look at how we actually program something that's in the NVIC. We're actually going to do a very, uh, a very similar type of application for timing, just using a different peripheral. So uh, give this a try and uh, check out the code, um, and I'll see you in the next video.